Well, welcome everybody. This is Jeff uh, Morissette uh, from the North Central. This is our monthly check-in. Uh, also in the room here is Jill Lackett, Brian Miller, and Dennis Ojima. Uh, to listen in, uh, what we'll do as we usually do is have a little bit of a science talk, uh, kind of uh, give everybody an update of some exciting stuff going on in the region, and then uh, around Robin in the last uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes or so about uh, the funded projects and any relationship or any uh, thing they need from either the foundational science areas or uh, the, the staff here at the North Central. So a little bit more on the technical weeds of uh, what we're doing, but we'd like to start off with something that's uh, generally uh, of interest to uh, researchers and the stakeholders. Uh, a couple of months ago, I guess, uh, Andy, as a team lead for the impacts area, and again, to remind people we have climate, physical climate, foundational science area, we got the ecological impacts on the fish and wildlife and habitats of concern, focus or foundational science area that Andy leads, and then adaptation and mitigation that uh, Jill, Dennis, and Shannon uh, lead up and, and work with. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and so uh, under the auspice of that foundational area, as well as the work that Andy's done in, in, uh, in the region, I uh, had a meeting a couple of months ago, and we asked him if he could summarize that meeting uh, to present to the wider group here. I think there's going to be a bit of a tag team uh, approach, according to what Brian was telling me. So. With that, I'll hand it over to Andy or whoever is running the, the, the show on that, that tag team approach. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Andy here. Um, I'll, I'll open it. We actually, uh, in talking with, uh, with Brian, um, decided to orient this just a little bit differently from rising our workshop. The workshop was uh, a little bit more in the weeds of details of different types of models and pros and cons of particular modeling, mechanistic modeling approaches. What we thought would be, might be more of interesting to folks on the call would be more or less to, to try to, uh, to just explain what do we mean by mechanistic ecosystem models and, um, and particularly focus on where they might fit into our tool bag. Um, when, when mechanistic modeling might be an approach, a tool set that um, the different climate science center um, practitioners would, would want to use uh, or not. And so we thought we'd, we'd focus on that but offer some examples of applications to, to, let, to let folks know the, the types of problems that the models lend themselves to dealing with. Um, so I'll open with just a few slides by way of introduction, and then Ben Poulter and Brian Miller and Katie Ireland will um, offer um, examples using different types of models. Um, and then if time allows, we'd like to have a little bit of discussion in the end. And uh, I see Steve, Steve Running is on the call, so Steve, anywhere you'd like to chime in on this is, is welcome, certainly. And I think Brian's going to advance the slides, so maybe we could, yep. Okay, so this, this diagram from a, a, a paper in science a few years ago, I think nicely illustrates that to really try to understand how ecosystem stuff responds to climate change, we need a variety of types of tools and approaches. And the ones here are, as you can see, organized from empirical and observational at the top through what's labeled mechanistic at the bottom. And uh, that mechanistic really, really focuses on um, specific mechanisms by which a species responds to a climate change um, or that ecosystem processes, processes vary under changing climate, for example. Um, and these different methods, uh, such as ecophysiological models, uh, manipulative experiments, they're really aimed at trying to get at those mechanisms. If we go to the next slide. The ecosystem, uh, the mechanistic ecosystem model might be defined in this way. It really deals with, again, the, what are the state variables and what are the processes that, that uh, link those state variables. And together, those more or less determine behavior at the population level, the community level, the ecosystem level. Well, these models more or less, of course, just use mathematical 
uh, representations of those of those interactions. So this would be an example of state variables. This comes from one of the models that we'll talk about, Fire BGC. These are the the forest stand level state variables that are included in that model. And if we go to the next, it focuses on the processes at that stand level. So you can see that we have a variety of climate variables at the top and then processes like transpiration and photosynthesis and respiration. And again, we don't we don't have the don't have the mathematical equations in here, but all those lines and arrows would be represented mathematically. We uh, we could go one more, Brian. Um, everything has its costs and benefits, of course, and uh, this is a slide Bob Keane put together that basically shows statistical approaches on the left and mechanistic approaches in the middle, but in a non-spatial way, and then mechanistic all the way to the right that really does consider uh, spatial interactions across landscapes. And um, more or less, we can think of these as simpler approaches grading to these more complex mechanistic approaches. And uh, the shapes of the uh, triangles and their direction more or less uh, contrasts what we gain or lose as we go from simple to complex. Top, we we basically see that the big reason to have complex models is that ecosystems are complex. Approaches often ignore that complexity. And so with these complex models, we can more explicitly represent processes. Um, that may provide new insights, uh, particularly for novel conditions that we haven't observed yet, that we can't observe empirically. Um, such as what's climate going to be like, you know, 100 years from now. Um, but um, computational requirements get to be large. Um, investment to develop them, moving to the next set of triangles, is high. The e ease of use is low. Um, the ease of understanding is low. These, these things integrate all these different states and processes, and it's really hard to figure out exactly what is driving a particular result. Um, complexity is high, um, but the hope is that that they really do help us with learning, and particularly help maybe things that are surprises to us that we didn't know about. So, like any other tool, they have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, and appropriate use and inappropriate use. So, if we go to the next slide, we'll just uh, offer examples from Ben's work with LPJ Guess, particular type of model, and then Brian's work, and then. Katie's, and then, and then we'll kind of end with Ben uh, coming back on and and really uh, just having one slide that that speaks to how how best we could link with stakeholders in using these models, and then again, if time allows, we'll have a bit of discussion. So with that, let's uh, let's turn it over to Ben. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so what uh, I'd like to do is present a couple of. Uh, applications that we have going on in the group using LPJ guests within the, uh, the, the North Central uh, Geographic domain. Um, and so while, while I present the, uh, these applications, I'll, I'll also try to touch on some of the, the mechanisms and, and physical processes that are going on within the model, uh, but, but try not to um, uh, get into to too much detail. Um, so, one, so one of the first um, so the first project that I'll, I'll briefly touch on uh, relates to climate impact work that we're doing in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, and we're using LPJ Guess to look at the vulnerability of, of, of biogeography and biogeochemical patterns across the GYE um, for a variety of purposes. And so, so one is to look at uh, how quickly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the biogeographic patterns, climate change, so in this kind of uh, climate change velocity context. And, uh, and then another is to evaluate uh, uh, how well the model performs uh, 
to simulate fire regimes. And, and then another is to look at uh, surface runoff, and we've developed a, a catchment routing model in, in collaboration with uh, Marco Mineta at University of Montana, and then working with uh, Molly Cross at the Wildlife Conservation Society to think about management applications of, of this uh, stream routing model. Um, we're also using the, the routing model work to uh, evaluate uh, the, the trends in uh, stream flow and stream temperature and linking this uh, to, to fish habitat and, uh, and kind of the fish uh, growth model that um, has been developed at NORAC. And then uh, we're, we're funded through the, um, the, the North Central uh, Office to um, look at the vulnerability of uh, sage-grass habitat, uh, specifically modeling um, sagebrush. Okay, so next slide. Um, so for the first, the first work looking at the uh, kind of climate change patterns in the GYE, um, one of the issues with running a running a mechanistic model is the, that there's a lot of different uh, climate data out there that can be used to make the simulation. And so this is a figure taken from Jared Euler's work comparing uh, temperature trends in the in the top panel uh, over the last 30 years or so between. Uh, top of WEX, uh, the first figure on the left, uh, the, the PRISM data set and the DAMAT data set. And so you can see this um, quite striking difference in terms of the, uh, the, the temperature trends over the last 30 years, depending on which data set you, you use. And um, the, the top of WEX mainly applies a correction to high elevation regions where there was a transition from uh, monitoring air temperature uh, with with uh, snow tail um, instrumentation, and and the transition in sensors somehow wasn't account, accounted for uh, properly within the data data set. And so when you account for the the, the different sensors, you, uh, you you come up with a different climate data set that has kind of radically different uh, temperature trends. So um, what we've been working on. As, as kind of the first stage is to evaluate uh, the, the, the consequences of using either the top of WEX or, or the DAMET uh, climate forcing. So next slide. Um, so this is just showing, uh, again, this for, for um, how the temperature correction with top of WEX uh, is much more important in the higher elevations. Uh, the top figure is showing the difference between top of wax and DAMET temperature for elevations below 1,800 meters, uh, average for the entire GYE region. As you can see, the difference is, is, is pretty minor, so uh, uh, and, and crosses uh, zero degrees difference um, in, in lots of instances. But then above 1,800 meters, uh, you can see that the, the DAMET temperatures are almost uh, two degrees uh, cooler in the first half of the record. Uh, compared to top of wax than in the latter half of the record. And so what, what top of wax has done is, is, is has, has applied this temperature correction, which has um, uh, removed the long-term trend by increasing the temperatures uh, in, in the first half of the, the, the record. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, so we've, we've run uh, the LBJ guess model of the GYE. This is the kind of the green colors here, so the uh, the geographic extent, and and so we've defined this based on uh, hot tens. So we we kind of have a nice uh, hydrologically consistent region. And uh, LBJ guess is, is what we refer to as a size and age structured model, uh, which means that within each grid cell in the landscape. Um, we have patches, which, which represent uh, uh, stands of trees and, and other vegetation. And uh, those patches can have different ages based on that disturbance history. So this generates an age structure within a grid cell. And then when, within each patch, we have uh, uh, different sized cohorts of trees. Uh, so, so this represents the, uh, the size structure. And um, the model runs on a daily time step. Um, and is driven by the, the climate data sets. 
uh, and, and each day the model calculates photosynthesis, carbon allocation, uh, respiration, and then uh, on, on an annual time step, the model calculates uh, different demographic processes, uh, like establishment, mortality, and, and disturbance. And so, uh, this, this, so, so there's lots of ways that we can uh, look at the data set. So we can look at the, uh, the state variables. Uh, we can look at the processes. We can evaluate the sensitivities. Um, and and uh, there, there's quite a long list of ways that, that we can look at um, uh, what the model's doing and how well it's doing. This is looking at the, uh, the vegetation in above ground biomass averaged over uh, the past decade. And the figure on the left is showing Daymath, and the figure on the right is Topowax. So if we go to the next slide. And, uh, and we can see that um, using Topowax, which has this temperature correction, we uh, end up predicting a lot of biomass in these, in these high elevation alpine regions. And so we're trying to figure out right now uh, which is, is, is kind of the most realistic uh, climate data set to use. So the next slide. Um, we've also developed a catchment routing model uh, to be able to construct hydrographs and, and stream temperature. Uh, the, the top um, panel of figures show uh, seasonal temperature changes for the GYE. So in red, you, you, can, you can see that there's been, there's been a warming uh, over most of the region for each season over the last um, uh, 30 years or so. The, the bottom panel shows precipitation trends and so we can see an increase uh, in some regions in, in March, April, May, and, and also December, January, February precip, but then a, a decrease in, in summertime precip. So next slide. And, um, and then the consequences of, of the increased temperature and, and the changing precipitation patterns has, has been to decrease uh, the snowpack. Uh, and so, so the bottom panel is showing the predicted snowpack from uh, from the LBJ gas. Next slide. And so we, we can put all this information together um, to then uh, assess the, the trends in stream flow. And so the top panel is showing the, uh, the surface runoff trend uh, for each for each grid cell. So we see an increase in surface runoff in March, April, May, uh, followed by decreases in uh, June, July, August runoff. And when this is routed through a uh, a, a catchment model, uh, we can we can then see which uh, streams and, and rivers uh, have have long-term trends in the in the discharge, and so uh, so the warmer um, March April May temperatures have led to a lower snowpack, which has led to higher uh, surface runoff, but then it, the depletion of the winter snowpack has led to um, uh, decreasing trends in summertime uh, stream flow. Next slide. Uh, the last uh, project is, is related to the, uh, uh, the stage grouse habitat modeling, and, and this is in collaboration with uh, Peter Adler uh, and, and others, um, who, uh, where we're comparing uh, species, statistical species distribution models with the LPJGS mechanistic model. Um, next slide, please. And um, and we can uh, we're we're in kind of process of parameterizing the model, which we'll talk about in this stakeholder uh, section in a bit. But um, we're, we're able to, to, to look at the, the successional dynamics of, of semi-arid uh, vegetation and, um, and then extract from this the, the climate sensitivity of uh, sagebrush. Next slide. And, uh, and again, so we, can, we have various outputs that we can uh, evaluate the model with, with, with data and observations. Next slide. And, um, and we can also kind of de decompose the, uh, the, the different plant compartments into their, their relative biomass pools and, and use observations uh, to evaluate how well the model is doing. Next slide. And uh, I think this I think this is it for me. So what's what's the next slide, Brian? Okay, keep going. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, so this is Brian Miller at the North Central Climate Science Center, uh, and very 
briefly here, uh, I'm just going to give a flavor of another sort of type of modeling approach uh, that uh, is also kind of being used to evaluate climate change impacts um, here in the North Central, um, and, and that is state and transition simulation models. Um, and these are, based on the description I have here on the slide, you can see it's kind of capturing a, a different level of detail um, than models such as process-based models such as LPJ guess, um, where you know uh, the, sort of starting off with box narrow type conceptual models of how uh, an ecosystem works, where the boxes are, are states or sort of groups of vegetation communities, and then the arrows represent transitions or, or any kind of process that can cause that vegetation to move between states. And so, um, you know, we can we can move from uh, a conceptual model, a box narrow diagram, to an actual sort of spatially explicit, stochastic, computer-based simulation model uh, to predict vegetation dynamics uh, both through space and through time. So we're still capturing uh, sort of the, these changes in vegetation, but again, at a different level of detail. Um, so we're not capturing the finer scale processes that something like LPJ guess might, but I think that there are, are some, some trade-offs or advantages uh, to maybe going with a, a, a bit of a a less complex model. And, and those are, um, you know, I think we can still capture quite a range of influences on vegetation um, from things like uh, fire to invasive species treatment to tree planting, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, by doing so, we, we actually can uh, use these simulations as kind of virtual laboratories to test some alternative management scenarios, as, as I'll show here in just a moment. Um, and I think here's where the benefits of a simpler approach come in, and that is that I think these are somewhat intuitive for folks. Uh, by starting with kind of a box narrow diagram and building up complexity from there, people can kind of uh, come in from the bottom, from the ground up, and kind of get a, get a handle on how the model is working, um, and even provide input to that modeling process. Um, and, and as a result uh, of this, you know, we have relatively low computational costs. We can build these models in a matter of uh, weeks, months, rather than uh, several years. And so I think in some ways this kind of a modeling time frame is a nice match with, uh, with more urgent management needs. So um, one application of this uh, is for whitebark pine, um, also in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and this kind of grew out of uh, Andy and Tony Chang and, and others' work uh, looking at how, using species distribution models to look at how climate might affect the, the potential habitat for this species um, and sort of realizing that although those statistical models are useful for understanding potential habitat, they omit other uh, variables that affect the distribution of white bark, such as uh, dispersal and competition with other species um, and disturbance effects. And so um, we, we combined and sort of took the, the output from those species distribution models and linked it to a state and transition simulation uh, in order to uh, look at white bark dynamics over space and time. And to build this model, we, we not only needed the input from, say, something like Tony and Andy's work, but also kind of going through the literature and what information we have on white bark pine um, to say, okay, well, what information is out there that we can use to parameterize our model? You know, what is maybe a little bit less well known or less certain um, and, and thus requires uh, further research? So, in a way, just the process of building the model itself, I think, helps to organize our thinking uh, and our available information about a given system. Um, and, and then once uh, we've now built this model, um, we're now toying with uh, sort of management scenarios. Um, and we can implement different types of management treatments, such as planting or insecticide or pheromone treatments for mountain pine beetle um, or thinning procedures and the like. And, we can kind of track the cost of these treatments um, and also vary them over space and through time. So, you know, we know that the National Park Service and the National Forest Service have different uh, restrictions and opportunities for management, and we can, we can kind of capture those. Um, and we can even sort of vary these treatments according to, to different, different climate zones. And, and we'll hear from Katie uh, here in just a moment a bit more about, about that work. Um, another application that's ongoing um, is work uh, as part of the funded project being led by Amy Simstad uh, and, and her team in Southwest South Dakota, um, and that's uh, indicated here. So black, that black polygon is Badlands National Park, um, and uh, we've also 
I've got this, this sort of broader purple polygon. That represents our, our study area landscape, um, which encompasses not only the park, but also um, Buffalo Gap National Grasslands and uh, parts of the Pine Ridge Reservation. And so within this study area, we're, we're sort of using a combined approach um, of using both qualitative participatory scenario planning together with this quantitative simulation modeling approach. And, and part of the reason for that is, is that you know, the, the scenario planning uh, work is really uh, quite, has been used in a variety of settings to help managers and even businesses and other organizations deal with uncertainty about the future. And it's proven effective at that, but we have heard, um, and, and folks in the Park Service have, have heard, that uh, there is a desire from managers and others to have a bit more quantitative information in that process um, to help underpin some of their decisions. And so this is a pilot project to kind of iter iteratively um, do this qualitative participatory scenario planning uh, sort of pictured in the middle there, uh, along with more quantitative simulation modeling on the, on the right-hand side of the figure, um, as well as bringing in uh, these climate scenarios um, over on the left. And so um, we're, we're kind of right in the midst of this right now. We've held our first scenario planning workshop. Um, we're now using that to kind of uh, modify our simulation model of vegetation dynamics within that uh, study area. And then we'll, uh, we'll run through the management and climate scenarios that were developed within the scenario planning process um, in order to kind of see if we can gain some additional insights through this quantitative model and then bring it back to, to folks in a second uh, workshop around the May timeframe. Um, and so to kind of summarize this work, I think, um, one of the benefits we're seeing of using these models is that we can really integrate our existing knowledge, and that includes using other model output as inputs into these simulations. Um, we've used species distribution model outputs, um, and then sort of tossed around the ideas of using outputs from models like Fire BGC or LPJ Guess um, as additional parameters. And now working with Shannon uh, and Dennis and Tyler Beaton uh, to think about how social science might also connect with uh, these simulation models. Um, we, clearly, we can compare the outcomes of different climate and management scenarios. We can do this within a, a same transition simulation, but also I think we can kind of uh, triangulate um, by using Fire BGC, LPJ GAS, and state and transition models to say, are we getting the same answer across these different approaches? And, and if not, why not? And lastly, uh, I think that these are really useful tools for documenting our assumptions about how systems work. and, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'd be interested to kind of pursue this idea of using state and transition models as, as boundary objects, kind of bringing scientists and managers together to, uh, to, to identify in what ways we, we think of systems the same way or in different ways. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to, uh, to Katie. Okay, thanks, Brian. So this is Katie Ireland. I'm at Montana State University, and I'm going to talk about bringing all, bringing it back to a mechanistic approach, but um, also an application to white bark pine ecosystems in the greater Yellowstone. So, uh, could you move it to the next slide? Um, Andy and I are working with Bob Keen and to, to evaluate white bark pine management alternatives um, to to determine where and how we can maintain resilient white bark pine forests in the greater Yellowstone. And this work grew out of Tony and Andy's work with distribution modeling and Brian's work with state and transition modeling. Um, so that we're working with an interagency group, the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee here in the GYE, to develop and evaluate management alternatives to white bark pine. And that meant um, we had to take a more me mechanistic approach in order to move beyond the, beyond the first path species distribution modeling work, which uh, gave us a good idea of climate suitability for white bark pine in the future, but to try to be able to incorporate the direct and indirect effects of climate through disturbance and beetles. Um, on white bark pine and to also be able to implement and evaluate management options. And so that's what led us to a mechanistic approach. Um, so the model we are working with was developed by Bob Keen at the Missoula Fire Sciences Laboratory. It's called Fire BTC. 
Um, it's been, sorry, you should move to the next slide. It's been implemented so far in about 14 different landscapes and used in over 15 projects, mostly by Bob Keane and his group, but also some outside researchers. And they've looked at things such as climate-driven shifts in fire regimes in glacier, effects of climate, fire, and grazing on vegetation succession and fire dynamics um, in grassland ecosystems, and fire and climate effects on stream temperatures and fish habitat in the northern Rockies. Go to the next slide. So this diagram shows how fire CGC is organized. It, it's a combination of the running for CGC mechanistic model and Bob's fire scum gap model. And some processes are mechanistic, others are stochastic. For example, fire ignition is stochastic, but most of the other processes, such as tree growth, mortality, fuel accumulation, insects, disease, fire spread, are all simulated mechanistically. It's organized along five different hierarchical levels, with the coarsest level being the landscape. Um, and in that, at that level, seed dispersal, cone crops, fire ignition, and spread are simulated. And next, the landscape is divided into sites, sorry, stay on that slide, sites, um, which are locations with similar topography, soils, and potential vegetation. And these are static. And then below that are stands, which are the individual vegetation communities that exist within sites. So these are dynamic and can change through time. This is where a lot of the carbon processes, fuel dynamics, understory dynamics, and management actions occur. Below that um, are species, and any number of species can be simulated, any number that the user can parameterize. Um, and finally, most processes are, are simulated at the individual tree level, such as growth, waterfall, and um, individual mortality are simulated at the individual tree level. The one thing to mention is entire stands are not simulated. Instead, a, a representative simulation plot is simulated on the stands, and that's just for computational efficiency. We can move to the next slide. This diagram illustrates all the important components of a stand modeled in fire BGC. So undergrowth represents all of the non-tree species and is typically represented by gill descent functional types to make parameterization easier, although it is possible if you can find the right species parameters to, to simulate individual species, and that is what has been implemented in the grazing implementation of fire BGC. And the fourth floor includes all the wood, litter, and dust, and wood is separated into 1, 10, and 1,000-hour fuels, such as twigs, branches, and logs. The overstory is represented by all trees larger than 10 centimeters CVH, and then smaller trees are represented in the understory. And this is where the flows of carbon, nitrogen, and water can be moved to different stand components. The waterfall and decomposition dictate for its floor dynamics rainfall, leaf area, and temperature affect water dynamics, and photosynthesis and respiration determine carbon dynamics. Uh, next slide. So basically just what is fire VGC and why did we find it useful to our application? As I mentioned, it's a, it's a mechanistic model. It's spatially explicit, and it simulates individual trees and professional dynamics. It also involves ecosystem processes and disturbances, such as fire, ignition, and spread. It can simulate multiple species and multiple ages, and it can operate at multiple spatial and temporal scales. But the three biggest reasons we thought it was important to our application are that it captures the processes important to white bark pine, such as climate, fire, vegetation interactions, it simulates the two um, major the disease, white pine booster rust and the pest mountain pine beetle that has been having a large impact on white bark pine forest. 
and we can use it to implement specific management actions. So the next slide, please. So we're implementing it in a factorial simulation design where we're looking at four different levels of climate ranging from historical um, to low and high future predictive suitability for white bark pine based on Tony's work. And we're just keeping fire management constant through our different scenarios because our focus is more on management activities. And then we're working with the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee to develop management activities that represent their strategic plan and then also to develop the no holds barred strategy that would implement whatever we think is ecologically most desirable to keep white bark pine on the landscape without considering cost constraints or accessibility or jurisdictional constraints. And then we're running this across four different representative landscapes um, because of the computational requirements of fire BGC, we can't run it across the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as a whole. So we're trying to choose landscapes that are representative of white bark pine in the system. Next slide, please. So there's quite a bit of output that the fire BGC can provide. It provides both tabular and map output. Most of the output is in tabular form with only 25 map variables, but it tracks the individual ident identity of every stand and then you can output stand level variables and map it back. So you can produce maps of any of the output variables that, that you request, but by default it only produces 25. And you can choose your output at different scales, landscape site, stand, species, or tree scale at a user-defined temporal scale from as long as it's annual or, or coarser. And just a few examples of, of the types of output that you can get. Um, we'll be looking a lot at basal area by species and fire return intervals. You get stand level information on the numbers of live and dead trees and their sizes and ages. You can get um, output such as net primary productivity and gross primary productivity soil outflow or evapotranspiration, and uh, as this slide says, there's over a thousand possible output variables, so lots of different information to either look at trends in the landscape or look at variables that hopefully will help to explain the trends that you're seeing. Next slide, please. So Fire VGC has several limitations and, and advantages. Um, you could click the next slide. So it's very difficult to parameterize and initialize. It can take over six months to do that. It tends not to be useful for short-term or small-scale predictions, and this is because of the stochastic elements. It, it's more useful to look at larger-scale trends uh, over the landscape over long time periods. And it, it's very complex, so it has long execution times and high memory requirements and a long training time. Next slide, please. But some of the advantages, it simulates long-term ecological effects. It's very comprehensive. And if you remember Andy's slide at the beginning of models ranging from simple to complex, fire BGC is certainly in the complex realm where it does have high computational requirements and difficult to parameterize and use, but it can model complex processes and, and reveal surprising results. And then also, for our purposes, it implements management actions, so we could look at the long-term effects of, of management actions on these systems. And then Bob has made the, the code is publicly available, and it can be compiled to run on any computer. So it's very much a research platform and, and not really something to hand to managers to run on their own, but it, it works very well to collaborate with managers and for scientists to be able to make any modifications they, they might want to run it on any computer or any, any application. I think that's all I have. Okay, so um, uh, this, is, this is our final slide. And um, <clears throat> here we just wanted to really touch on um, bridging the, the, the gap between having these, these mechanistic models um, 
be as, as, as Katie says, kind of more of a research platform to um, having them being used to help inform management decisions. And um, there, we, we recently uh, had a, a workshop in, uh, in Patagonia. The, the, the picture here is showing uh, Thomas Kitzberger's uh, research group down there. And we're, we're, we have a project um, where we're using LBJ Guest to look at um, four step dynamics over, over, over paleo timescales. And we decided to have a, a week long workshop with uh, Thomas's group and other um, ecologists from, uh, from the region to help us uh, set up and parameterize uh, the, the model for the regional vegetation. And um, it, it, it really helped us uh, get up to, up to speed in terms of the parameterization process, but also to um, help educate and, and uh, in, interact with uh, regional ecologists that have similar research questions but different tools available to them to, to carry out the research. Um, so, I, so I've kind of highlighted here uh, four uh, steps in terms of getting the model going and, and uh, all the way to communicating the, the results of the model. And uh, we, we could, I, w I wanted to, uh, in a sense, so more transparently how things are, are done during this, this engagement and, and model uh, parameterization and simulation phase, but also it, it could provide uh, kind of a useful, or the beginnings of a, of a useful template uh, to, to engage people in, in, in the future for, for different projects. Um, so we had this phase of, of, of simply setting up the model, identifying uh, the, the species, uh, the, the plant functional type groups that we are interested in, uh, calibrating the species traits, so, so things like um, phenology, uh, the, um, rooting profiles, um, information on, on reproduction, and so on. Um, the running of the model, so this did involve discussions in terms of which climate and, and soil data sets are needed, uh, how to address um, initializing the model to, to take into consideration different management and, and disturbance scenarios. Uh, then, then this whole phase of evaluating the models uh, using various benchmarks or, or looking at uh, some of the trends in, in the variables. And then, uh, and then lastly, communicating uh, the, the results uh, using different visualization tools, um, trying to be consistent and on the same page in terms of the terminology that's used to describe the results, and uh, and then in terms of sharing uh, the outputs of the models um, and and working with different data formats. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the 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 NRAP um, activities from uh, the Forest Service, so these uh, uh, the, the Northern Rockies um, Adaptation Partnership used. The MC1 uh, dynamic global vegetation model to help drive uh, the stakeholder kind of dialogue and, and communication uh, for ranking the vulnerability of different species. And um, I think I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from uh, the NRAP activities in terms of of terms in terms of in, involving uh, managers uh, with with mechanistic modeling and. Um, it, it seems, yeah, it seems obvious that managers should be involved through the uh, through all of these different stages that are identified here, um, and and that this really helps in in the last phase in terms of communicating uh, the the results into something that um, can be kind of applied uh, on the ground. So, um, okay, so over to Andy. Thanks, Ben and Katie. And Brian, um, if there's just one more slide, and it uh, it just is a picture of the cover of our of our uh, technical report that came from the workshop. If anybody's interested, we're happy to send this, and it would uh, provide a little more detail on these models and some of these issues we've discussed. So, Jeff, with that, now we're uh, we only have what less than 15 minutes left in the hour, so I'll leave it to you to see if there's time for questions or discussion about this or whether you'd prefer to just move on to people's summaries. 
Uh, you know, I think that we have the, the, the utility of the spreadsheet is for any project to report what they're doing, especially if there's interactions with the other uh, foundational areas. I didn't see anything entered in February that uh, looked like it. there was no entries for the interaction with the foundational areas and the management focus projects. Uh, so let me open it to questions. There's a lot of good information here, and I'm, I'm curious if people do have questions. And let's let let's sort of play out the rest of the time on that. Uh, maybe try to stop about five to in case there's something, and we would just reserve those last five minutes for if somebody has some questions and or, or issues, and we'll just take those offline. Uh, but but allow some questions from the group or uh, or uh, any reaction to what uh, you guys presented. I have one. This is Dennis here, Climate Science Center. In looking at sort of the stakeholder engagement, it seems that there's a, a Im improvement on the interface between the research of the related to these models and to sort of the management targets. And I think we might take an effort to actually, as you know, Ben was saying, engaging the management um, community more directly. Identifying what are the sort of targets that they use in the decision making, and then realign or restructure our modeling outputs along the specific um, targets that management uh, management groups actually use in decision making. And you could use look at sort of either landscapes or by geochemistry and water ecosystem services, um, or looking at species. There's probably categories of um, decision-making targets that we can identify and align with our model outputs more effectively. And I think that's where we need to actually start moving toward and looking at this engagement with the management community. Yeah, I could just comment on that. Andy, again, um, I think it's a good point, Dennis. And, you know, we could even think about the RAM facility being a place where that you know, interaction happened. You know, as as the Climate Science Center invests in models like LPJ Guess and uh, the state and transition models, um, and develop and as a group we develop the expertise to be able to run those well. I, I, I do think that that then sets up that potential for these. Um, these links between a particular uh, management application and, and the use of the models to inform that, where where stakeholders could be, um, you know, asking for particular types of outputs or particular runs, and uh, and the modelers could be generating those. So it'd really be nice to ultimately think of just as we've had great success in the Climate Science Center and using species distribution models in that way to be able to actually do that, that same thing with uh, these mechanistic models. I, this is Jeff. I really like that idea. I think that uh, that's really kind of the strategy behind the RAM is not just species distribution models, but it's, it's uh, mechanistic models and it's a place to engage those users. So I'm really excited about that and I think maybe we think about kind of in the next year or so perhaps a workshop in the RAM where we roll up our sleeves and see what the, the, the compute, the software and the visualization requirements would be for that type of thing. The fort and myself and uh, the Powell Center are talking about the enhancement to the RAM where it's going in the next five or so years. Uh, this is really, you know, I, I I think what we've done with the viz trails and the scientific workflow is kind of took the black box off and made it a bunch of gray little boxes and at least people kind of start to understand what the the options are or you know what the components of the model are certainly what the output is and kind of with its warts and all I think by seeing that process and if we could do that for other models and it it, it, it allows for the ultimate plan of being more responsive to management needs, so being kind of having the solicit kind of those uh, questions or management uh, support that we're hoping to move towards, it's complex to sort of then put any of these models towards those questions, but I don't think you sort of fully answer that question or give them what they need unless they kind of understand a little bit of the modeling, and I think that's what you're getting at here is that you, you really 
want to have it be, and this is the co-production of knowledge, I think it's just kind of a very, you know, it's kind of, an, it's living into that idea that you can't just kind of ask them what they need, go away, spit out model results, and expect them to use it. We really need to kind of dig under the hood, have them at least have an understanding of the, the uncertainties and the components of the modeling, and then help them define that parameterization or that sort of interpretation of the uh, the results and the uncertainty. So, really exciting, and I think this is a great you know, kind of uh, uh, convening of the good ideas, some great models in our area, and sort of maybe Andy and I and, and Dennis and others that were talking take offline and, and the support at the, the fort uh, through Colin uh, in the RAM, uh, what, what we have the uh, capacity to do there and think about a workshop maybe in the next year or so. One question I have is the, the, the Euler paper that uh, uh, Ben showed at the, at the very beginning seems like there should be more news about this, like the climate deniers should be, you know, ringing us up and telling us IPCC is wrong and, uh, you know, uh, does anybody else kind of look at that and just go, "Holy, only we, we this is this is pretty crazy." I mean, that's yeah, I mean, it, it got picked up by the, the climate deniers, but uh, not as it wasn't as, as um, yeah, it didn't make as big a splash as, as one would have thought. I don't know if Steve is is still on, but. Um, I mean, it definitely, uh, it definitely was was picked up. I think that, but the problem, the problem. I mean, I, from what I understand, uh, the, the snow cell group has have have archived all of the original kind of resistance measurements that that go into modeling temperature, and so they're going to revisit those uh, the original database to uh, to come up with a, a more consistently corrected. Uh, Temperature record, and so it, it seems maybe that the, the top of works is is more of an interim uh, temperature data set. But we're we're finding that, and it's quite interesting. But we're we're finding that the, the top of works needs to be radically different um, uh, by geographic and by geochemical patterns across the GYE, uh, where where in these high elevation sites uh, we're we're growing. You know everything's pretty happy there's no temperature limitation. And so um, uh, so it's kind of interesting to think about evaluating climate data sets with, with the vegetation model. Uh, and, and now we're, we're going to be using AVHRR data sets to look at the greening trends in these high innovation regions and see whether uh, LPJGS produces realistic greening trends with top of OX or, or with DAMET. Yeah, so a couple of comments. I mean, one is, you know, with the climate trends, those are, you know, the, what is being produced by the National Climate Assessment is really based on weather station information. So it's really on the impact side of, of understanding what impact models are using what climate data sets under current conditions. And so what this is illustrates is more that DAMET has, you know, a much warmer trend embedded in its extrapolation across the United States, especially in the western portion. I think it would be useful to actually um, think about, you know, um, Jared or others reproducing a summary of this um, the, in the way that you have been into EOS um, as sort of saying, you know, as we look at um, current climatologies to build our impact analyses that you know, user beware, or, or we, sh we need to be more carefully aligning the current climatology and trends used for impact analysis with things like um, topo wet um, WX. Although then it leads to how do we actually get a better or a coherent precipitation data set to go with the temperature data set? And that's one of the disconnects right now with looking at the temperature versus precip that you both need, you need both data sets to drive impact. Well, and I would, I think, really, I see Candida, I don't know if MTS or Joe are on, but what are the implications to data sets? 
bias corrected. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how many have been diaspected to PRISM or DEMA. I think they use different data sets, but are they as different at, from this? And so what does that mean? So it's important to, uh, to note that if you compare for, for GYE on average, if you compare TOPO WX to PRISM, you don't that relatively little area, of course, is above S is substantial. And, and consequently, for the modeling efforts that um, have been done at the resolutions until now, it's probably having, having used Topo WX to drive those, by and large, probably would not have resulted in very different yields. It's just now that as we go to these finer spatial scales, and particularly for studies like, like Ben described that are, that are in, that are focused on landscapes that have a, a lot of high elevation, that it becomes a big deal. Um, take it personally as a, as a bummer at all. I mean, the, basically the Climate Science Center contributing to, to Jared and Steve's effort to do this correction and improve our ability to map uh, climate, um, that just indicates science is marching in the right direction. And so now, basically, everybody needs to be using Topo WX for temperature in higher elevations, I think is the message. Uh, I, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, I think the jury's out. If we look, if you go, uh, Brian, if you can move forward like three slides. Sorry, did you say three slides? Yeah, the next one. Uh -huh. So, so this is the difference in biomass using Tupperware with bay mass. And if we use, and basically it's saying if we use Tupperware, we're growing a lot of, of a lot of biomass in alpine regions. And um, I I think we need to follow up. Well, we are following up on on this pattern, but I I think we need to be Really cautious with with using top of X. What? Because you're saying you think that the maybe Daymat is giving you a better when they put Daymat the input your your vegetation is reality better. Uh, it's, it's possible if you if you go uh, to the well if you go to two slides previous to this one. Yeah, this one here. So I mean, you can see that the lower panel here shows. Uh, the, the temperature difference for these high elevations, and um, and Sulphowex is, is much warmer in this 1980 to 2000 time period, and uh, and then and then the the Daymet and Sulphowex have similar temperatures up to 2000, and um, so what what the, the implications are for the model is that the, the, the model is much more productive in these in these higher elevation regions, and um, and and it's it's Visually, it's, it's very noticeable, um, and, I, and and it was it was surprising to us how how different this, this trend correction was because it was actually changing kind of the the entire growing environment, not not just the trends. But Ben, we're not disagreeing at all. Mm -hmm. I'm saying for study areas that have potential area above those thresh those elevational thresholds right you get a big difference but there's re in the western US there's relatively little area above that so the previous studies at an 8 kilometer grain size for the western US they're not wrong based on that sure yeah sure sure well, right yeah sure no i just i yeah i i, I see that i uh, i but but there is you know with this figure showing that the biomass difference we we have seen quite large changes and large differences. Right. So again, places that have the high elevation get it right, mm -hmm. and uh, and your type of work helps us illustrate the, you know the need to do that. I will say that climate deniers have paid no attention to uh, the. Uh, temperature correction we came up with. They don't read uh, actual journal articles. 
and uh, pay attention to facts. Oh, sorry. That's right. And I think you you want to recognize that uh, that uh, Jared's work is uh, simply correcting observational temperatures and what the consequences of those temperatures are to the ecosystem is is a, a separate question that's well worth answering. Uh, and the bias correction. What are the yeah. implications for bias corrections? Yep. And so down. now we're we're hot in pursuit of taking a hard look at humidity data, which is even harder to deal with than temperature data. I, I hope we don't find any <laughs> surprises uh, like Jared did, but uh, humidity data is, of course, the basis of calculating things like aridity in the West. Well, you know, interestingly, uh, Frank Davis was saying over the weekend they've done a lot of microrefugia work, and he basically says that the temperature profiles six inches off the ground are quite different than two meters off the ground where sure. these data sets are derived. Um, and so for regeneration of seedlings, for example, the, it's a big deal. So even uh, I think do think we have to keep in mind um, that these these climate extrapolations are you know rough approximations at best. Well, and that's where using the modus radiometric surface temperature actually gives you a better look at the the regenerating environment of a seedling uh, than a screen height air temperature does. Yeah, let me let, let's pause. I know a lot of people are dropping out. Uh, if there's anything for the group that uh, people want to just flag, and again, probably just take it offline at this stage in the call, uh, just open the door for that. Just some general announcements. Um, I've sent this out to you all, but ESA abstracts are due Thursday on the 25th for those of you submitting. Um, also, there is a um, Another meeting um, in July, the International Rangeland Congress, which actually inc incorporates our region in a sense of the Great Plains efforts and some of the grassland efforts. Um, so that is in Saskatoon, so it's close by. So we're, uh, a group of us are submitting um, abstracts. Those are due on the Monday, the 29th. Thanks. That's good to know. I want I know Gene Chambers. Um, <laughs> I'll be doing between now and tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and I think, Steve, I need to follow up with you as far as the topo weather stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, I can, I, I'm, that's on my list of things to do. It'll be sometime in a couple of days. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate people updating the spreadsheet. That does help us kind of uh, to turn to the science presentations and questions. Uh, again, uh, the doors open if there's questions uh, for me or the center. Uh, and then you've got the foundational team lead you can always reach out to, but didn't look like there was a lot there for uh, interaction. I appreciate people updating the spreadsheet. And uh, until next month, well, I think uh, in March, uh, Gabriel has uh, got somebody lined up with the EPA. Is that the... Um, I know NatureServe is talking to us in May about some yeah. data sets and climate issues they're working on. I can't remember. And uh, I think, uh, no, Bats McKnight, oh, yeah. who, uh, because of some health issues, had to, or it's a doctor's appointments and things he had to take care of, uh, I think not critically serious, but uh, but short-term uh, emergencies, uh, had to take care of some things in January. She's going to join us in March. And then the EPA, uh, I think it's EPA. Uh, some in Gabriel Sine is working on some other extended data, data sets in April, uh, climate related. So watch for the uh, email with our nice uh, CSC uh, logo to inform you of these. And uh, until then, we'll uh, we get to stay in touch otherwise. So thanks everyone for joining the call.